Um, hi, everybody. I'm excited to talk to you guys tonight about stranger danger. So I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint and um, we will work off of that. I have some videos and things to show you guys tonight as part of this. And while I'm doing that, let me um, just introduce myself a little bit as well. Um, so my name is Sarah Bond. I am a certified dog behavior consultant, as well as a um, certified professional dog trainer, knowledge and skills assess. So those are the letters after my name. Um, but I love working with dogs who have issues with um, reactivity, fear, aggression, anxiety. And so that's why I am talking about this tonight. So we're gonna talk about stranger danger. Can everyone see my PowerPoint okay? Okay. All right. Um, so like I said, this is me. <laughs> and those are my dogs in the picture as well, uh, Clara and Percy, who both have had their own issues with um, reactivity of various kinds. Clara on the left there is my stranger danger dog. All right, so let's talk first about what is stranger danger. Um, basically, when we're talking about this today, what we're gonna be talking about is it as referring to dogs who are fearful um, and or reactive um, with unfamiliar people. So people that they don't know or don't know well, um, they might bark, they might you know, bite, they might try to run away, um, they might get really scared and just be super still. Um, so the bottom there, you can see I put common reactions to new people with these dogs can be, fall under the categories of fight, flight, and freeze. So we think about that, you know, we talk a lot about fight or flight. And um, there's other categories that happen there too. And freeze is another one that we can see happen with our dogs when they get into that kind of mode. So we, I will have some examples of that. So stranger danger can occur when you're at home, people coming to visit. Um, it can also occur when you're on walks and they're seeing other people. Um, or if you're in public places like a dog friendly location, like a store or um, a park. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about before we get into like the videos and how to actually work on this is the importance of safety and how to set your dog up to be successful. We always wanna make sure that not only are we keeping the people around our dog safe, we are also keeping our dog feeling safe. That is incredibly vital for our dogs to be successful. So some of the ways that we can set up for safety, um, managing the environment is a huge one. And that can be, you know, maybe setting up um, your dog at a big distance from people that are coming into your home. Maybe they have a area where the door is closed or there's a baby gate up um, where they can feel safe and away from everyone. Um, maybe they're on a leash with one of the family members, you know, across a big yard, but we wanna make sure that they have enough distance where they can feel secure. And as you, you know, close that distance and get closer, that's usually when most dogs start to feel like they need to do something, right? If they're actually getting you know, nervous or scared or they feel like they need to protect themselves in some way. Utilize tools like basket muzzles, leashes, harnesses, baby gates. Um, those things can really help you set up some safe setups for your dog. I use, you know, most of the time, I'm gonna have a dog on a harness and leash when we're working on this to begin with. If the dog has a bite history or it seems like they might, you know, be, um, we don't want to put them in a situation where they're going to bite, but if we want to have it as an extra safety tool, we can also teach them to enjoy wearing a basket muzzle. And then of course, things like baby gates and pens and crates can help us kind of set up, you know, out of the way areas for our dogs to be. The other rule that I think is really, really important to remember is not to put your dog in situations where they feel the need to protect themselves. So we want our dogs to be able to trust that we're only going to put them into situations where they feel safe and they're going to be safe. Um, obviously we can't predict everything, we can't control everything, but as much as we're able to, we wanna set them up where they don't feel unsafe. And so that means that we have to think ahead to how they might react to a certain situation. And if it's a situation that might be an issue for them, um, and even if they don't usually have an issue in different situations, watching their body language to make sure they're actually comfortable. We'll talk about that a little more too. 
And then if necessary, with dogs who are more of a bite risk or who um, are you know, really having trouble, two levels of management can be a good option. Um, it's really easy for someone visiting your home to accidentally open the door to where your dog is and let them out um, or to you know, open the door and there your dog is and the dog is suddenly has their space invaded on and that can lead to problems. So some dogs need kind of two levels, whether that's in a crate and behind a door, um, a baby gate, you know, and a muzzle, you know, there's different ways we can combine those things, but it does kind of keep us extra safe in case one level of management fails. And then also remember that your dog cannot skip from kindergarten to college. Um, they have to learn at their own pace. So, you know, if your dog is really terrified of strangers right now, they're not going to suddenly tomorrow be ready to greet people. We have to kind of allow them to get there, you know, at a pace where they can be successful. Okay, let's get to some more fun videos and things. So this is just an example video of a dog who is reacting to someone coming into their home. Um, this is me walking into the home. I generally do not get video like this because most of the time I'm trying to set the dogs up to not bark at me. Um, but in this particular case, um, this particular dog just happened to be a little more wound up than I knew before I arrived. We were practicing people coming in the door um, and there was just a little bit too much going on for this dog to be successful. So I happened to get this on video and I wanted to show an example when I talk about reactivity and stranger danger of what that looks like. Okay, and again, this is a dog that I had worked with before, um, but me coming in the door became a much bigger trigger than we realized this particular day. So we ended up going back a little bit and working on that. Um, but this just gives you guys an example of one of the ways that we can see dogs kind of display that underlying stranger danger issue. And then I wanted to show um, a different option too. Sorry, didn't mean to replay that. <laughs> there we go. Um, so this dog here, you're going to see a few times today. This is Leia. Leia is a dog that I pulled from a shelter um, years ago um, as a potential service dog candidate. You can see her on the left there looking like an adorable happy puppy. Um, we got her back to the service dog program as an adolescent after she'd been with some razors and she, as she aged, um, had become really, really fearful. Um, and that can sometimes happen in adolescence um, for a lot of reasons. There can be genetics that are kind of kicking in it can be an experience when they were very young. Um, she was in the shelter as a young puppy that could have been stressful. Um, there were many things that we, we didn't really know why this exactly happened, but every dog's a combination of nature and nurture. So it could have been something um, that was gonna be there no matter what, or it could have been something that was you know, partially influenced by an outside force. But either way, when she came back, she was really terrified. Um, she didn't wanna get out of the crate that she came in She'd been on a drive for a couple of hours in that crate. When we finally got her out and into a larger kennel for her to kind of decompress in and hang out in, um, she basically wouldn't move for like a day. So this is a really good example of a freeze um, and just a dog who is completely shut down and terrified. So it's not the most fun video to watch, but it gives a pretty good example of a dog who is really in distress, even though she is barely moving. And there's just really subtle little signals here. Um, you can see more of the whites of her eyes. She's doing that kind of slow blink. Um, she's very, very still. You know, she's got that little tiny head movement, but that's about it. She was purposefully not looking at us at all. Um, so we knew that this was going to be a big problem. And, um, you know, even with the people that she had met before she left, she seemed to react to us like strangers. So we kind of had to start with her from the beginning with stranger danger. And so you will see a couple of examples of her as she progressed through, um, as well as the poodle in the last frame and a couple other dogs. All right, so step one, we wanna get our dogs feeling more comfortable with dogs at a distance. We do not wanna start with the stranger right up against us. <laughs> That's gonna be really hard. And we will talk more about this, but I don't recommend just having strangers come up and hand your dog treats. Um, because generally that stranger is then getting way too close to your dog for them to actually stay comfortable. 
Um, and a lot of dogs will take the treat and then realize, oh no, I'm way too close. Um, and that can definitely lead to problems like a bite um, or just a really fearful or reactive response. So we started a distance where the dog is feeling pretty comfortable. The dog in this photo does not look particularly comfortable. He looks like he's feeling a little unsafe. Um, kind of hunched in the, you know, up there with his, you know, shoulders by his ears and he's definitely kind of curled in on himself a little bit. So we don't want our dogs to have body language like that. We want our dogs to have body language where they are loose and relaxed and kind of maybe wiggly. <laughs> we want to kind of see their bodies in a C or an S or have that tail kind of loose and wagging. Um, we don't necessarily, you know, know what our dogs are thinking, but we can kind of make an educated guess based on body language. And that's what we're looking for when we practice is we wanna keep our dog at a level where they notice the person, they should know the person's there, but far enough away where they're not going to be too stressed out about that person. So you can see a dog there who really wants to do the flight option. Um, it's really trying to move away. Um, and these are just kind of stock photos that I found that really illustrate some of these things. But one exercise that we can do is um, called open bar, closed bar. And this is basically desensitizing and counter conditioning. So we are trying to get our dogs used to the potential trigger, in this case, a stranger. And then we're trying to change how they feel about that stranger, which is the counter conditioning part. So what you do in this exercise um, is basically when the trigger, the person appears, you start feeding the dog and you feed the dog pretty much consistently until the person is gone. And when the person's gone, the treats stop. So what happens is the dog starts to think when a stranger appears, when I see a stranger, I'm gonna start getting all these amazing treats and good things are gonna happen. And then when the stranger goes away, the treats stop. So the stranger is the predictor of all these awesome things happening. Um, so this can be a little bit tricky just because, you know, the timing has to kind of be right and we have to make sure they actually notice the person and again, the distance needs to be right too. Um, so over time, you would gradually decrease the distance of this and make the person, you know, maybe moving in different ways or wearing a hat or doing things that might be a little bit more challenging for the dog, but only as they can manage it. So an other, another option that kind of does a similar thing, but is a little bit more of a behavior is engage, disengage. Um, there are a few really similar versions of this game. Um, look at that is very similar as well. This is basically an exercise. We're going to mark good behavior and reward it, right? So a click from a clicker or the word yes um, is a marker of good behavior. It tells your dog you did something right and food is coming. In the videos I'm gonna show you for this, I think one of the dogs I'm using yes and one of the dogs I'm using a clicker they mean the same thing in these videos. And I am just rewarding the dog for looking at that unfamiliar person. When they look at the stranger, I click her yes and I give them food. So over time, they start to realize that looking at that stranger makes good things happen. And it can kind of turn into a look at the stranger, look back at you because they're expecting the treat, which is a nice kind of automatic behavior to have when they see people. So this is a great distance exercise um, where you are the one doing the rewarding. And this dog, you will notice I am scattering the food on the ground. That is because for her, it made things a lot easier. She calmed down a lot more with that. Um, she is in her driveway um, in kind of a busy neighborhood and we are just watching people. And she generally was very reactive and would lunge and bark whenever she saw a person. So that scatter keeps her occupied for a lot longer. <laughs> yeah. So she looks, I say yes, and I toss some treats on the ground. And that is how that engage, disengage works. Right. All right, here's one more example of engage, disengage. Um, this is a poodle puppy. Um, who was living with their person in an assisted living facility and there was a lot of construction going on um, right next door and the puppy was a um, service dog in training and had started to get um, nervous about all the construction 
and had done some barking at the construction workers. So we were outside watching the construction from a distance and working on engage, disengage. A little quiet but if you can hear that click that's when he turns his head back to me um, i click as soon as he looks and then i go ahead and bring that reward which in this case is a little pouch of like a squeezy treat great and you can see he kind of turns to me and ends up refocusing and sitting down which is fantastic tells me he's a lot calmer and he's able to kind of refocus back to me all right so once the strangers start to get closer, you know, what do we do? Um, first of all, don't rush this. <laughs> Let your dogs keep distance as long as you can, as long as they need to. Um, the moving closer should happen gradually. And you really wanna watch your dog's body language for signals that they are stressed. Um, if they are, you know, putting their ears back, putting their tail, trying to move away, um, you know, their eyes are, you know, whale eyes where they're showing a lot of whites. Um, you know, they're flicking their tongue out or doing big yawns. Um, those are kind of signals that they might not be comfortable and that we might need to give them some more space. And then there are, of course, the more obvious signals like barking and lunging. So allow them to move away if they need to. If you notice those stress signals, give them more space. You know, even if we get too close, we can move away, especially when we have them on leash. It's pretty easy to just turn and walk the other direction or move, you know, to the side where we have a little bit more room. And you don't wanna make your dog approach someone. You only want your dog to approach when they are really ready um, to go up to that person. So we're letting them have the choice of when they get to go say hi. Um, we're not gonna make them say hi because someone else wants to say hi to them. We're gonna give them you know, the freedom to say no if they're uncomfortable um, because that helps us prevent further problems from happening. So one option that I do with this as we start to get people closer um, I mentioned earlier, I do not recommend having you feed treats out of a stranger's hand to begin with. There is a point where your dog may be okay with that and that might be a good option. Um, but it's a really commonly given piece of advice that can backfire. And I've seen several bite situations um, with different students from basically strangers handing them treats and the dog being really food motivated, coming up to get the treat, realizing how close they are, getting really scared and biting the hand. So we don't want those kinds of things to happen. We want the dog to stay super comfortable and to only approach when they're ready. Um, so I use a version of treat and retreat, which is a um, method that was developed by Suzanne Clothier. And basically what you do is you have your stranger, whoever's helping you, um, stand or sit. You want them to be kind of non-threatening um, ideally, they're, maybe their sides a little bit to your dog. They're not staring at them or leaning over them. Those things can be very intimidating. And they toss treats to your dog. Um, ideally, they're tossing treats even a little behind your dog because then your dog turns and gets the, tr gets the treat and they do not feel pressure to get closer. We don't want them to think, I need to get closer to get the treats. So we let them decide if they wanna move closer, they can move closer if it's safe but the treat's gonna to come to them. So they don't have to. We're just creating a good association with that person standing there or sitting there by having those treats tossed, but we're not making the dog do anything they're not ready for. I um, mean, giving the dogs a choice, you're gonna kind of see probably as kind of a theme through this. We, we really want them to you know, feel empowered that we are not going to force them to say hello um, because then they're gonna trust us a lot more <laughs> to keep them safe. And it's gonna be a lot easier to work them through some of the next steps of this. So obviously we do not wanna see the teeth like the dog in this picture. Um, I just picked it because it is a, a you know, good example of a dog who's asking for some more space. All right, so this example is a dog that I was met in a parking lot. They lived too far away to meet at their house. So we met at a um, fairly empty parking lot near a park. Um, and this dog was doing a lot of um, barking and lunging at strangers, in particular men. Um, so, you know, we kind of knew the reaction to me might not be as big. 
Um, and we were hoping that it wouldn't be so that we could kind of start with some more comfortable stuff. But I want you guys to see what this looks like. Um, the first minute or so, you know, I'm just kind of talking to the person. We're getting used to each other. Um, you can't see me, but my side's kind of to this dog. I am looking at the person, not at the dog. Um, I'm kind of watching them out of the side of my eye, but that's about it. And you can see this dog already is showing some signals of stress. Um, it's a little antsy. You can see a few tongue flicks. The tail is down. His ears are kind of back. Yeah, his ears are back. He's panting. Not a lot. Okay, that's good to know. She does tell me here that he did get car sick, so that could be part of the panting, <laughs> but that can also be a sign of stress. Mouth stuff for sure. But he's he's definitely not totally comfortable, so I'm going to start tossing him some food. So she has to kind of point it out to him here. He didn't really know where it went, but once we get this going, then he's a little bit more comfortable with it. So this is a version of treat and retreat. I'm just tossing the treats out towards him. He does not have to get any closer to me. He's just kind of hanging out in that spot, but treats are coming. Good job. And he does get a lot more interested really in me as we're doing this. Um, but again, we're not going to make him come over and say hi. I'm going to let those treats come over to him. And he's definitely getting a little more comfortable with me. He's a little more comfortable, I think. Yeah. Because um, from what you described, I, you know, I would have expected a little more lunging and barking. Yeah. <laughs> but um, here is a skateboarder about to come by, so that could be a different. Um, he does have a reaction in just a moment because there's a skateboarder. Yeah. Let me just kind of go back into doing some stuff with me. I just want you guys to see one more thing in this video, which is um, coming up in just a minute. Again, has trouble finding the treats, so his person is helping him out a little bit there, and that is totally okay, fine. Movement can be helpful, and we're also trying to give him a little bit more distance here. And here you see him get close to me, and then go, oh no, that was too close. <laughs> So he backed himself up, his ears were kind of, kind of went back, um, he realized it was a little bit too close there. All right, so let's talk just briefly about body language. You know, I can't give you the entire scope of dog body language in this, you know, talk today, but there are a few really common myths that I think um, with dogs who are fearful of unfamiliar people uh, create problems. Um, one of those is the belly up behavior. When we see a dog offer us their belly, um, generally what most people think is they want a belly rub. They want us to scratch their belly. And sometimes they do. <laughs> sometimes that's what they're asking for. I would say the dog in the right of this picture, the, it looks like a doodle or a poodle. Um, that dog looks a lot more comfortable and relaxed. Um, there's a lot more looseness in that body language. Um, it seems more like that dog is happy to have their belly rubbed. But if you look at those two dogs on the left, um, those are not dogs that are really comfortable. And so the belly up behavior can sometimes actually be a, look at how non-threatening I am, please don't hurt me, please give me space kind of behavior. So it seems kind of counterintuitive to us, but to the dog, it is one of the signals they might give. Um, and I, again, have seen bites happen from this being misinterpreted before as well. When you look at those two dogs on the left, you know, this is just a picture. So we don't have the, we don't have a video. We don't know what happened around this, but they're both very stiff. They look very tense. Both of them are showing some whites in their eyes. Um, both of them feel like they are, you know, their shoulders are kind of hunched up with their paws in there. Um, the one on the left, you can see the ears are back. Neither of them is looking at the person, right? They're both kind of purposefully looking away. Um, and then we have the little guy on the, in the middle there has his tongue kind of flicked out and those tongue flicks can also be a stress signal. Um, again, this is a picture. He might have just been licking his nose. We don't know. <laughs> but I did want to kind of give an example. And luckily, I found these two stock images that kind of show, you know, those are not dogs who are comfortable and enjoying themselves necessarily. Those are dogs who maybe are under a little bit more stress. And um, they're giving a lot of behaviors that are trying to say, you know, please don't hurt me. Um, so 
you know, we, we want to respect those signals. And if we notice the dog is staying really tense and doesn't seem comfortable with the belly rubs um, or doesn't really seem like they're asking us to, you know, come in and interact with them, we don't want to come in and interact with them. Oops, wrong way. All right. Um, another common one is licking. So we think of licking as like a friendly behavior from dogs, like it's a, you know, I'm giving you kisses, right? That's how I see people interpret it a lot. And sometimes, again, it seems to be kind of a friendly affiliative, like I'm, you know, I'm trying to kind of tell you that everything's okay behavior. Um, but sometimes it can be a, you know, kind of a plea for safety as well. And a look at how non-threatening I am. Um, please don't hurt me kind of behavior. So you can see Leia here again in this video with one of the trainers that I was working with, Jane, who's an excellent trainer. Um, she was just spending some time there with Leia. Um, this was a couple days into Lane being back. She was a lot more comfortable with us, but still not sure. And you'll see her give some side eye to me a couple of times because she doesn't like that I'm filming her. And then she's a little uncomfortable with that petting there. Jane pulled her hand back and tried again. Okay. The camera a little side on you. Yeah, and like it, she came in a little bit more, um, but you can see Jane's going slowly there with her to kind of make sure everything's okay. But that licking that she displayed in the beginning, um, you know, yet, could it be that she's saying, hey, you know, I'm okay with you? That can be part of it, but a lot of it usually in these situations is kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I wanna make sure that you, you know, know that I'm non-threatening so that you don't hurt me. Um, and so that's that's kind of part of what that can be as well. Now, I have a dog who licks me all the time um, and she is just, just what she likes to do. <laughs> so it's not always something bad, um, but we do wanna, again, pay attention to the whole picture. If your dog is licking and they also seem very, you know, tense and stressed and they're, you know, they seem like they're being really like deferential or submissive behaviors as we would kind of look at them you know, those are things that make us think a little more. Maybe this dog isn't actually comfortable in telling me how happy they are. Maybe that they're, maybe they're saying, you know, I feel unsafe. Okay, another thing that I really love working on with dogs as they get used to people in their space is relaxing near people. So once this is, again, we're going through these steps kind of fast. <laughs> you are gonna go through these steps if you go through them over you know, weeks, months, it can take a long time for depending on the dog, but relaxing near a person is a big deal. And so this is the poodle that was barking in the first video and um, she loved her person petting her. And so we took a second to let her relax with me sitting on the couch. Um, this was a few sessions in, she was getting more comfortable with me and um, we use this as kind of a reinforcer for her as a reward, um, but it also helped her to kind of take a breath and relax. And if your dog is not able to relax easily, which some are not, there are a couple of really wonderful um, relaxation protocols that can help you get started. And I've listed them on the side there, um, Dr. Karen Overall's protocol for relaxation and Suzanne Claudier's really real relaxation protocol. Um, they're both great resources. But this is just petting, kind of like massaging, basically. And this dog is not very far from me. We're not ready for her to me at this point, but she can be in the space with me and she can relax and get pets. And that's a big step that she is this relaxed near me. That tells us a lot about how she's feeling. All right, and her again, we're gonna show you touch. So I love teaching touch um, with dogs like this. Um, first of all, touch is a great behavior in general. It's just them touching their nose to your hand. What it tends to do for most dogs is it makes seeing a hand a much more positive experience because they know when I touch that hand, good things happen. Um, and it's a great first interaction when you're starting to introduce them to someone when they feel comfortable enough to actually start interacting. It gives them some control as well and some choice. If you if someone puts their hand out and they go and touch it, they get a treat. If they don't touch it, no big deal. Nothing, nothing bad happened, right? So we're just saying, hey, if there's a hand there and you just tap it with your nose, you know, good things are gonna happen. Um, and that creates a really strong um, feeling for a lot of dogs. And you can actually see 
um, in this video, um, this dog is extremely enthusiastic about touch to the point that she's choking herself a little bit. Um, and we had to be careful about that, you know, letting more leash happen in the future. Um, but she is super enthusiastic. I had not at this point petted her, you know, I tossed treats. She'd, you know, done a, one or two hand touches with me. She did way more hand touches with her person at first to get used to the cue. Um, and then we started introducing them with me. Um, and I think you can see in this video that I'm also still tossing treats out instead of handing them, but at some point I did start handing them. Okay, so I'm just gonna hold my hand out. You can see her body language change when she sees my hand. Yeah. This video is not great. It's a little hard to video and train at the same time, but you can get the idea. The enthusiasm is a big part of this. <laughs> Hey. Yeah, you hey. yeah. like, you're gonna like knock, knock my camera. <laughs> knock All right, so that was that. And here's Leia doing touch. Again, this isn't the first few days of her being there. So we're doing it through the kennel door. And I believe this is Jane training her again. And you can see she's giving her little bits of canned dog food on her flat hand. That was what we, how we discovered that she liked her food. Um, she wasn't eating a lot because she was too scared to eat very much. And a lot of times when dogs are too scared, they won't eat. Um, that's why the distance and stuff is so important. But that's a great example of doing some touches. I'll show you that one more time. And you can see she's still moving kind of slowly with small movements. She's still showing a lot of whites in her eyes, um, but she has the choice to go towards that hand or not. And she's decided it's worth the, the wet food. Okay. The other interactive behavior I like to teach dogs um, once they have worked on things like touch is a chin rest. And a chin rest is basically the dog setting their chin on your hand. So again, this is not the person, the stranger touching or petting the dog. Those are difficult things for a lot of dogs to handle. This is if we're trying to get them used to a person, they've been doing really well. We've gotten to the point where they can be near the person. Um, maybe they've done some touches and now we wanna see, can you interact a tiny bit more? Um, again, low pressure, they get to choose to opt in or not do it. When I do this behavior, I hold my hand out um, with the palm up so that the dog comes and their chin is going to come across onto my hand. And I just start by taking some treats and leading them across my hand usually. Um, this great Dane here um, was a big sweetheart, but really nervous um, of new people. And um, you know, if you've never been growled up by a great Dane when you walk into their house, it's an experience. Um, <laughs> but he was really just an absolute sweetie and um, just a little bit nervous um, about strangers. So we worked a lot on some different things. And this is one of the things that we worked on. Um, it also helped you know, him be a little bit more still and calm around the kids in the house, which is a good side benefit. Good attention. Good. Let's try that chin rest one more time. Good. So he actually offers the chin on his person's Aww. leg there. Um, which is really cute. It wasn't the behavior, but I, you know, I would say generally I would take that because it's a nice resting behavior and it's very sweet. Um, if it's the behavior that I want and I like, I'm going to encourage it. Um, so that was kind of short. So I'm going to play that one more time. So he moves his chin here to go on the hand. That's the behavior. And it's kind of a still behavior once they get it. So the person offers their hand, the dog brings their chin forward and sets their chin on the hand and they get rewarded. Um, if we are working up to eventually petting the dog, which you do not have to do if your dog is not, you know, going to be doing that with many people. But if it's someone that you want to be able to interact with your dog a little bit more, the chin rest is a good precursor to eventual petting because petting like under the chin or the chest can be less threatening than like say over the head. And so if we start with the chin rest, we might be able to just move our fingers a little bit and reward that and then build up to a little bit more petting. 
Um, but again, with all of these steps, do not rush them. You want to go at your dog's pace. That's really, really vital with things like stranger danger. Um, we do not want to push our dog past where they're okay. And then another option here is teaching alternative behaviors. So we can replace the behaviors that we don't want with behaviors that we do want. So what do you do when you see a person? Um, if you're walking your dog and they tend to stare at a person and bark and lunge, we want them to do something different. So this first dog on the left, on the boxer, um, he definitely was reactive to people and very afraid of strangers. Um, so this is a redirection cue that I'm using for him. He's learned that the word here means awesome things happen right up at the person. So when he hears here, he turns back to me to get his treats because he knows that I'm gonna have them when that word happens. Um, so let's do that one. Oops. All right. So this is in a Home Depot. Here. So you wanna watch for his head turn. Here. That's what I'm cueing basically. You see a person, you turn back to me. Good. So he kind of did it on his own there a little bit. Here. Good job. Yes. Good boy. Yeah. Right. And that last one, he kind of did it automatically. I didn't even have to say here. He looked at the person and looked back at me. That's the eventual behavior I'm trying to build with that one. Um, I also love with a stranger danger for dogs who are shy or scared, teaching them tricks to show people instead of actually saying hello can be a fantastic option. Um, I have, you know, had students who taught their dogs how to like wave or spin um, or take a bow, um, you know, just to kind of have people go, oh, what a cute dog without feeling like they have to get close to the dog. Um, Leia learned to sit pretty. This is her behavior. And she would do it for almost anything but it was one of her happy behaviors that she liked to do. All right, and then this one more, one more another Leia video here. <laughs> she gave me lots of good videos for this. Um, so consent and choice. I mentioned choice earlier. Um, we talk about consent with people a lot. We don't think about it as much with our dogs because they are, you know, even though we usually consider them members of the family, they're also our pets, right? So we kind of assume they're gonna want to do things that we want them to do. Uh, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't want to be petted. And that is definitely the case with a lot of stranger danger dogs. If it is someone that they are not comfortable or familiar with yet, they may not want petting to happen. And so I do like to do a little bit of a consent test with dogs to kind of see if they're okay with petting once we start petting. Um, so you'll see kind of a quick version of this. Um, the trainer that's working with Leah Elizabeth is um, you see her pet, take her hands off briefly. And when Leia moves in just a little, she goes back to pet again. Um, it happens a few times, but it's kind of fast. So just kind of watch for that. But those pauses are where she's asking, do you want to keep going? So just real brief pauses. Leia comes in a little bit. She pets her some more, she stops. Leia goes towards her a little bit and she keeps petting, right? So there's just very brief moments in there that we're looking at um, a pause to kind of make sure they're okay. And it can just be the dog moving towards you a tiny bit to say that they are okay. She moves in each time and says, yes, please keep petting me. So some of my general rules for success with this, kind of to kind of, I guess, sum this all up. You know, we wanna give our dogs choice. Um, it is very important for them to feel comfortable and safe and allowing them to choose when they are ready to do things is a huge part of that. Um, we wanna celebrate small victories because most of the time with dogs who are fearful, um, we're not gonna have huge leaps every day. Um, so we wanna find those little victories and say, hey, overall, we're moving in the right direction. And this was a big step for that particular dog. And really, you know, celebrate those things. We, we want to know that we're making progress. Um, it helps us and it helps our dog. Keep your dog feeling safe, so important. Um, teach your dog skills they can use. And I, I showed you guys a few in there, um, like the touch and the chin and the, you know, the tricks and the here. 
but this could really be just in general, it, the more basic cues and things that they know or tricks or, or whatever they enjoy learning and you like to teach, um, the more potential options they have to try instead of, right, the things that we don't want them to do. And then create good associations. You know, it's so important that our dogs actually feel comfortable and that we're not just kind of masking. Um, and one of the reasons that we are really, you know, that I'm really careful about in these situations, not having anything negative happen is that negative associations tend to be strong and they take a lot of positive associations to kind of overcome them. And we want our dogs to have good feelings um, about, you know, other people in their space so that we don't have any issues. We don't have reactive behavior. We don't have a really stressed out, fearful dog who's shutting down or trying to run away. Um, we don't have bites happening. Um, those are all things that we have to kind of be thinking about. And the way to actually work on that and not just kind of put a, put a bandaid over a much bigger wound is to try to kind of get at that underlying um, emotion. Um, again, we don't know what our dogs are feeling exactly. We have to kind of make an educated guess based on what we're seeing with things like body language, but we can make those educated guesses um, and watch, you know, if our dog seems relaxed and happy um, and what we would consider happy, right? Um, versus tense and uncomfortable. So looking at some of those body language cues that we talked about earlier with that loose, wiggly, happy dog versus the dog who is tense and um, whale-eyed and, you know, has everything kind of pressed down into them, like their ears and their tail. You know, those are things that we really want to be keeping an eye on. Okay. So um, I have my contact information up here. If you want to screenshot this, I think it will be in the recorded presentation as well. And in just a moment, um, I will come back into Zoom and answer any questions that you guys have. Okay. Awesome. Oh, if you there we go. have any questions for Sarah, um, please feel free and put them in the chat box for us so that we can answer those. Um, Sarah, the first question is, does anything change for treat and retreat if the dog is barking at the stranger? I don't wanna reinforce the barking, but I do wanna gradually get them used to the stranger. How can I do this simultaneously? Yeah, so I mean, in, in an ideal world, they wouldn't be barking, right? We have them at enough distance where they're not gonna be barking. Um, but it's, if they are barking, you can actually still do the exercise because we're really trying to get at the underlying feelings about the person. And if they feel more comfortable with the person, they're probably not going to keep barking. Um, so I, I would say generally, I ideally want the dog to not be barking, um, mostly because that tells me they're not really comfortable yet. Um, but I don't worry as much about reinforcing the barking itself with that particular exercise. Another so, question. Yes, you can, you can keep oh. doing it. No, go Another ahead. <laughs> question. When is it time to turn to medication? We've been working on these techniques for months with our seven month old. She has many, many great strides, but it is also unpredictable. Um, she yeah. can have several great or neutral interactions and then suddenly lunge and bark unexpectedly. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And generally when I think medication is um, a good option is when, um, for one thing, you have been working really hard and your progress is non-existent or super, super slow and your dog still seems really uncomfortable we have to get our dog into a state of mind where they can think clearly and learn and feel comfortable for this to really work. So um, sometimes that's the time. Um, I also look at the dog's quality of life. Are they scared all the time? Are they, are they constantly having things that trigger them and make them uncomfortable? Um, if that's the case, and that does happen sometimes in situations where maybe you, you live in a busy neighborhood or complex and you really can't hey Sarah I think we're getting some audio so yeah I oh, think those are. are some of the times Let me, okay can you hear Just me a little bit of a it? lag yeah we can hear you now okay hopefully that's better 
Yeah. One of the other things in terms of medication, somebody already mentioned, what do you do if the dog is already barking? Sometimes when we have situations where we can't get far enough away, then we think of medication sometimes as helping us just yeah. get a little bit more distance. Um, someone Definitely. said, have you managed cases where the dog's stranger danger is based on guarding their human? In this case, a dog would be fine greeting strangers normally, except when their preferred human is nearby. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I've seen that many times. And, um, you know, again, we, we can't always know exactly why the dog is reacting, how they're reacting. Um, we're always making educated guesses. Um, but sometimes it does seem to be related to the person being with them, whether that is a, you know, a sense of feeling that like they need to protect the person or feeding off of the person themselves feeling a little bit tense, maybe tensing up on the leash or um, you know, again, it could be like even a resource guarding um, situation. Um, a lot of the techniques that we use are similar. Um, there might be some adjustments to maybe how we set it up. We might, you know, um, we might have someone else handling the dog at first and the person a little bit further away, or we might just have the person and, and you know, we have to kind of think about different aspects of like making sure the timing really relates to the other person. So they're not just thinking, oh, I'm getting treats, you know, from my person in that situation. If that makes sense. But yeah, it's it's definitely a not an uncommon scenario. Um, and there, there's really lots of ways that we can deal with it. And most of them are fairly similar to what we talked about tonight. So we have another question. Uh, my dog and I have a great time at dog parks and I always leash her when we go into new areas. She'll have great and neutral interactions, but then be triggered by a select person, usually someone holding something like a large bag or swinging a leash. Should I just never have her off leash? It's a tricky question because I know that like you said, there's times that everything is great, but when we have times when there is something that's a trigger for our dog, um, it's always better to be prepared and you know as safe as possible. So there's a couple ways you can approach this. I mean, definitely you might start with having a, a leash or at least a long leash as part of the prop as part of the you know uh, setup. Um, but you can work on things like someone carrying something, or you know those are things that you can do some of these exercises with. Um, you can do like engage disengage with a person holding a big bag. Um, that's definitely a workable thing for most dogs. It's just that, again, sometimes when we're startled, those responses can be bigger. And if it's unpredictable, we don't always know when it's gonna happen. We, we do wanna make sure that we have some safety measures in place, whether that's a leash or a basket muzzle or you know whatever is the best in that particular setup. So now we have a question. What about a dog who seems to get comfortable with a group of friends after lots of positive association and treats? but every once in a while will unexpectedly lunge or try to herd very specific individuals. Should I be avoiding these interactions altogether instead? So sometimes you can set up safety measures in those situations. Um, you can have the dog, you know, maybe again, leashed next to you or leashed and muzzled. Um, I have seen some dogs who, when they're a little bit more on the fearful side and they're showing kind of more shut down or overwhelmed type behaviors, it can look like they're kind of okay in the moment. And then when the person turns to like walk away, they might then lunge because they feel safer to kind of tell them to get out of their space. Um, it can also be depending on the dog, you know, some dogs um, find movement to be something that's startling or that they need to kind of deal with in some way. So depending on what you're seeing, you know, if you can kind of identify when that seems to be happening is it just that the person is getting up and turning away is it that they're you know the movement that seems to be a problem um but i will a lot of times pair that with something like engage disengage or the person tossing treats as they're doing it to get the dog a little more comfortable with it um but again you know we want to have those safety measures in place we don't want any bites to happen so um we want to make sure our dog is really feeling comfortable and that we have you know set things up where everyone is safe Awesome. Um, I will wait just a second to see if there are any last minute questions. So if you have a question, please pop it in the chat. 
Uh, you can also email Sarah. She put out the contact information. I'll make sure it goes out um, in the presentation or in the recording as well. Um, yeah. But just quick notes. Again, this is being recorded, so it should be up tomorrow if YouTube cooperates, and I'll make sure that everybody gets the link. Um, if you are so inclined, we have a bunch of cool webinars coming up, so keep tracking the website for those. Uh, we do have Spanish classes uh, for those who are interested. Um, and please keep in mind that we sell t-shirts. We would love reviews. If you like what we're doing, please take the time to give us a review on Google, on Nextdoor, on Facebook. Um, and donations are all always appreciated. We are a nonprofit trying to make sure that these kinds of resources are available to the community. So if you have any questions, let us know. You can always uh, email us and we'll make sure you get in touch with the right person as well. I don't see any other questions right now. Um, but if you think of something, just let us know and we will make sure you can either get in touch with us or with Sarah. And thank you again, Sarah, so much for being here tonight. We yeah. really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Have a great night, everyone. Bye.